It's your man Rondell Jordan, aka the Black Swan. I'm back with a new podcast for you today. Something to think about. A little food for thought. Today, I'm talking about Adam and Eve, the story of Adam and Eve. A lot of us know Bible stories through storytelling. People telling us a story or reading a watered-down version of the story or hearing a story, either on, you know, TV or a pastor or whatnot, wherever you heard the story. Hearing the story paraphrased is different than reading the story. Bible writers were scholarly during a period where there was a high rate of illiteracy among the common people, all right, in the region of which the Bible was being circulated. You also have to keep in mind that the Bible was, at one point, in opposition to the church. The church didn't want the common people to have the literature. Um, and then even for African Americans with, with their heritage in the colonial slave eras of the United States history, knowledge was forbidden. Knowledge of yourself was forbidden. Uh, everything African was outlawed. Um, if you practice certain faiths or healings or uh, chanting and all that kind of stuff, anything that was not considered civilized in the European frame of mind was outlawed. You have now, you know, uh, Creole and Voodoo and Contemplate and Capriella, the martial arts that um, is practiced in Brazil. Um, it's a karate that is disguised as a dance so that it didn't appear as if it was something that they were bringing to their, for the purpose of their defense uh, from Africa. All right, so the point I'm just trying to say is, is that you have to keep in mind the context of history when you're reading the Bible because the Bible is, you know, it's written in a mysterious way. It's written poetically. These are, you know, I consider allegories or parables, stories that are designed to give you a lot of messages in a little bit of words, you know. And to get to the point of today's story about Adam and Eve, it's just one short chapter. You'll see how quickly the story goes by, but there's a lot of information. I mean, goodness, think about what religion has done with the story, and it's just one chapter in a book of 50 chapters called Genesis, okay? And they all relate to each other just like the chapters of any book relate to each other. Okay, it's a story that's unfolding, that's telling you something about the mystery, the mysteries of this world. Okay, so I'm going to get just into the story. I'm going to read it word for word, verbatim. I made Paul's, I should permission of Paul's, you know, here and there to highlight certain things so that we can have certain things in common in mind when we're uh, considering the story. And then, you know, I would love, you know, any type of discussion or comments. But I'm going to, today's topic is about Genesis chapter 3, okay? I'm going to preface it just a little bit, and I'm going to go a little bit above that and in, in, into Genesis 2, start at about Genesis 2.22. One thing I do want to point out before I get started is the environment, the background, the, you know, what, what region of the world we're talking about. In Genesis 2, you know, I noticed some, you know, very interesting things, okay? It says, uh, number one, the tree of life was also in the midst of the garden and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Now a river went out of Eden to water the garden and formed there and parted and became four river heads. The name of the first is Pishon. It is the one which encompasses the whole land of Hevilah, where there is gold, and the gold of that land is good, but Dillium and the onyx stone are there, okay? So we have to pinpoint, okay, where is there gold at? Where is there Bedillium at? Where is there onyx stone? Where is all three of these found commonly? And 
you know, in my my study, and I looked up bedillium, which is a resin from a North African plant. That's also they they say it can be found in in India. But then you add that with onyx stone, and you add that with gold, this rich in gold, and you get Ethiopia Eritrea around that region of the world. And then um, if we continue it and says the name of the second river is Gishan, it was it is the one which encompassed the whole land of Kush. Okay. The name of the third river is Hadeko, and it is the one which goes toward the east of Assyria. The fourth river is the Euphrates. Okay, so I'm going to stop it there. That was uh, Genesis 2, verses 9 through 14. Okay, um, and, then, and then it says, Then the Lord God uh, took the man and put him in the garden of Eden and t and to tend and keep it. Okay. All right, so fast forward to 222. Then the rib which the Lord God was, had taken from man, he made into a woman, and he brought her to the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore, man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. Okay? I find it common that, you know, and this is still early in Genesis, but I find it common throughout Genesis that the writer tells you what's going to happen, and then it manifests, right? Then it happens, okay? Um, it is either a prophecy and then the, the, the manifestation of that prophecy, okay? The fulfillment of that prophecy. So that's the pattern, and that's a good pattern. It's a secret, you know, one of the things you profess something, and then you manifest it. All right, you you create the action, the you know the efforts to enact it. All right, so anyway, let's get into it. Genesis three. It says, and I'm reading it verbatim from the King James version, so you can follow along with me, so that there isn't any dispute about words or whatnot. But in the King James version here, it says, Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat the fruit of the tree of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it least you die okay now shall shall is you should will and should put together okay so something like you shouldn't do something right uh, you shouldn't play in the street okay if you play in the street and you get hit you know I told you that you shouldn't you shall not I'm looking it up in a Webster Collegiate Dictionary, 5th edition. Shall, which comes from shout or should. Okay. I am obliged. Okay. As an auxiliary verb following, uh, followed by the infinitive, with, uh, infinitive without to. Okay. But shall, when used in the second and third person, is expressive of some authority or compulsion on the speaker's part, as in, thou shalt not kill. Well, shall is associated with should. Okay? So, it's a recommendation. Highly recommended. Okay? And I just wanted to denote that. Also, I want to also denote that... The use of God. When we're reading here, I want you to um, think about the characteristics of the God in which we're talking about here. Because we can't assume that one man's God is another man's God because there's many different gods on the earth. 
So we all have different gods. So we have to understand that then once we find out if there's a common denominator between what one man says this God is and what mine says, okay, we both talking about the Creator. We both talking about this omnipresent being. We t talking about this divine intervention or whatever you want to call. But I'm just saying, we once we get to know the characteristics of what each other is talking about, then we can say, oh yeah, 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 I believe in. Oh, I believe that too. I, I, that's you know, I do that too. We, we know the common. We, we see the common and we can come to the decision. But we can't just walk up. My man in New York, they, you know what I'm saying? The man said, I'm God. Well, what do you mean? You need to define what you mean by that. You know, you know, you can't just take it as they say. So I want you to say that, you know, that, you know, this was translated. This was, you know, written by a colonializing force, a conquering power. So we, these are just parts of the reality. So I'm going to start right here. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, has God indeed said, you shall not eat of the tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. And the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die. For God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Okay? And, you know, uh, I'm going to keep going because... Good and evil, you know, is just knowledge, right? Good and evil is, is knowing, you know, the good and the bad of any given thing. And I like to give the story, you know, of, you know, I'm a gazelle, you know, the good part is I can go to the water hole and I can feed my thirst if I, you know, quench my thirst. That's the good thing, you know, it's a hot, hot day, let's go to the water go hole and get, if nobody tells me that, there are alligators in there lurking and then also behind the bar there are lions lurking and you know hyenas and all these different vices out there the cons of the situation then I'm innocent just walking by the water hole ignorant right blind to the reality all right but I really appreciate you to tell me for my life, okay, so that I can take part of the tree of life or whatever, I can take part of life, my own life, I want to be able to know about both the crocodiles and the doves, okay, and so we can label it evil, we can say the good and the bad, but I don't want the word to trump the meaning because a lot of times we, you know, words have symbolisms that, you know, have been, you know, placed inside our mind. So uh, let's move on to verse six. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree desirable to make one wise and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. Okay, so right now, you know, what jumps out at me is, is that it says she also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. So, you know, it's not like she went back to him and had to do convincing. He was, he was right there. You see what I'm saying? And, you know, I want to highlight, it says, so when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, it was good for food. She saw in some way, shape or form that it was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes and it looked good and a tree desirable to make one wise. So the fruit was like passion fruit. I mean, it was it made you wise. She took of its fruit and ate. OK, food for thought. Right. She consumed something that made her wise her okay and it says she also gave to her husband with her and he ate or he consumed it as well 
then the eyes of both of them were open. So, number one, I want to say that she gave to her husband. I like that. That's a good thing. All right? And they ate, then their eyes of both of them were open, and they knew that they were naked. Now, first, that's a comma, and they knew they were naked, okay? So, their eyes of both of them were open. So, they realized something. Obviously, it's, it's, it's playing on words here for a reason, okay? Because we know that they weren't walking around blind, right? They were able to see that the fruit was good. She saw that the tree was good for food. So, it's saying that she was able to see. It's not talking about whether or not her eyes worked or not. But after she consumed the fruit, or she ate, he and he, she and he ate, it says, then the eyes of both of them were open, and they knew that they were naked. So now they knew, you know, of, you know, it's like when the, when the, when the people come in with the, with the guys, the, the uncontacted people that's living in the depths of the forest in Brazil, right? There's a movie, uh, there's a documentary on Netflix uh, called First Contact, and when the people go in, you know, and they find these, these guys, and they, you know, they try to create dialogue with natural living people, Aboriginal style people, and once they make contact, the first thing they do is they notice that the modern civilized people are wearing clothes, right, wearing shoes, right. And one of the things that they exchange is clothes, hats, shoes, flip-flops. They love the flip-flops, right? Which is very Brazilian, or Rio de Janeiro at least. But the, uh, the point I'm trying to make here is you lose a certain innocence once you become encountered civilization. And the first thing they want to do is they feel ashamed because they were naked. In, in the preface in Genesis 2 verse 25, and it says, And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. And so now, in chapter 3 verse 7, now that their eyes got this new, what, wisdom, the fruit of this information and fruit of this knowledge, right? had an impact on how they viewed themselves, their perception of the world. And so that is the innocence lost, right? Right? The innocence is lost. They're not going to run about naked anymore, just vulnerable anymore. But now they, the first thing they did after they knew that they were naked and they sold fig leaves together and made themselves covering. So they became creative, number one, they, they made themselves coverings out of fig leaves, it says. In verse 8, and they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. Okay? And the, they heard the sound of the Lord God walking. So this, they was able to hear this individual we're calling Lord God walking in the garden. And when? In the cool of the day. It was cool. We're going to just leave that alone and move on. And Adam and, he, and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Verse 9, Then the Lord God called to Adam and said to him, Where are you? So he said, I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. So, this is another characteristic of this God. This is the reason why I said, keep it in mind. You give me your opinion. I'm going to give you mine. It says, then the Lord God called to Adam. So, he had to call out to find Adam. Okay? 
because Adam and his wife hid themselves. He says, where are you? And it says, so he said, which was Adam, I heard your voice in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked. So he heard his voice, number one. So this is a voice, an external voice. And they heard him walking, right? And he calls out. And when he calls out, he responds immediately. And he says, I heard your voice in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. All right. And so let's moving on, moving on. And he said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you that you should not eat? Then the man said, the woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me of the tree and I ate. Kind of a blame game, huh? And the Lord God said to the woman, then the man said, the woman who you gave to me to be with me, she gave me of the tree and I ate. And the Lord God said to the woman, What is this you have done? And the woman said, The serpent deceived me and I ate. So I just want to say that they both first instincts was to blame. Okay, he blamed it on Eve and Eve blamed it on the serpent. Serpent also, you know, has been personified or whatever into a snake. A serpent has two definitions. Number one definition you know, uh, a nauseous creature that creeps, hisses, and, or stings a snake, especially a large snake, okay? The second, uh, a subtle, treacherous, malicious person, okay? Serpent, the two definitions really is a snake or a subtle, treacherous, malicious person, okay? So, in this sense, in the sense of the story, you know, it is my belief that it is not a snake. It's actually, it's a, the second definition. A, a, a person who's being considered treacherous, okay? But, uh, let's move on. So, it says, and he said, who told you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you that you should not eat. Then the man said, the woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me of the tree and I ate. And the Lord says to the woman, what is it? What is this you have done? And the woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. So the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, you are cursed more than all the cattle. You are cursed more than all cattle and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you shall go and you shall eat dust all the days of your life. And I would put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. So again, I'm telling you, this curse, I guess, or saying to the serpent is telling you that it is a person, a man, a type of man. And I believe most likely Egyptian African. And it's, it's set in a stage of enslavement, the enslavement of the people, and all that stuff is, you know, it's going to come later on in Genesis. I've just got to keep in mind that, you know, Joseph was sold into slavery, right? And then he ended up becoming the governor of Egypt, okay? So I'm just saying, you know, and then Egypt and Exodus is really taken down by Moses, right? But what I'm saying is, 
you know, Abraham's wife, um, Hagar, I mean, excuse me, Sarah, and their bondservant. So Abraham's bondservant, Hagar, who has had his firstborn son, um, Ishmael, uh, she was what? Egyptian, right? So we, we, we kind of think of history in, in the other way around. We kind of thinking of the Egyptians enslaving the 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 Hebrews or the you know what is identified now in these days the Jewish people, but uh, it in the story is actually the other way around. But I'm just telling you this is trust me setting up. Um, in the future, the future story, okay? And it says, again, it says, because you have done this. So it's saying to you, you are cursed more than all cattle, okay? So, be, you know, if we think about it, black people, in their perspective, right, were made into a livestock. Uh, Abraham's slaves was considered livestock. Right? They were in between the male and the female goat. <laughs> okay? So, and more than every beast of the field. And we were treated, the, the, the African slave was treated worse or like a least commodity than any other creature on the planet. Right? On your belly you shall go, and you shall eat dust all the days of your life and I will put enmity between you and the woman who is you and the woman so I'm tell you a little bit more and between your seed and her seed okay <laughs> he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. See, we're talking about man and woman here. It's just so mysteriously written. And that's why I'm trying to say you got to really read this. Okay? Between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed, he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. So it's telling you his right there in the second to last word. To the woman he said, I will greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception. Conception, it's a double entendre. Conception is when you conceive something mentally or when you conceive child, okay? And it's saying you will greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband and he shall rule over you. So her curse is that she is now made subservient to her husband. Right, woman is is made as a lesser than a man in this point. This is Genesis three, okay, and this is un un African man. This is um in in Africa, and um, you can look at the in the late days of Kemet, you know, and throughout many African kingdoms, men and women ruled together. Uh, women were as much deified as the men, but it, it was just part of the balance. But in pain you shall bring forth children. Okay, it's a mindset, I believe. You know, your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. And then to Adam he said. And I'm at 17. Because you have heeded the voice of your wife and have eaten 
from the tree of which I commanded you, saying, You shall not eat of it. You shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for your sake. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Both thorn and thistles it shall bring forth for you. I think thorns and thistles, I, I just think cotton, cotton picking, working the seed, working the land. You see what I'm saying? Picking cotton, thorns and thistles, and you shall eat the herb of the field, so you're eating the bitter part. But herb is also, it depends on how you view it, herbs are actually healing and positive thing but I think in this sense it's trying to say bitter in the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground for out of it you were taken keep in mind for out of it you were taken for dust you are and to dust you shall return and Adam called his wife named Eve because she was the mother of all living. So I just want to pause real quick and just say, you know, in essence, they got cussed out a little bit, right? And, you know, and it wasn't really that bad. It's saying you're going to have to work, right? And, you know, uh, you know, it's going to be thorns and picking thorns and thistles, and you're going to be eating herbs and bread. And a woman, you're going to be subservient to your man, and you know, and um, you know, childbirth is going to be painful. So he's telling you, you know, what? You shall bring forth children. They had not had children before. They have gained this knowledge, right? Now he's telling them they're going to bring forth children, and then now your desire is going to be for your husband. And what is he going to do? He's going to rule over you, <laughs> right? So he's just telling you that what's about to happen. You you know now that you guys know this new this information, right? Now you know you're naked, right? It sounds like something my dad said to my sisters when they were finding out they was dating and being with men and stuff, right? And even in the beginning, it tells you. Like I said, the first thing I read is Genesis two twenty four when I said, "Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother." and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And they were both naked, and the man and woman's wife, they were not ashamed. They were innocent. Now they not. Then Adam, you know what I'm saying? So to Adam, it's saying that now you're going to have to work. Toil, you, you, in toil you shall eat of it. So you're going to have to eat. You're going to have to work for your food. you got to get about, since y'all are doing the do. And know about this. And you're going to have to do it all the days of your life. You're gonna be eating. You're gonna eat the herbs of the field, herbs of healings. It's the sweat of your face. You shall eat bread. So you're gonna to have to chop down the grain. You're gonna to have to mash the grain up into a mill. You're gonna to have to. And it says till you return to the ground. For out it says for out of it you were taken. That's the first time. So twenty, and Adam called his wife named Eve because she was the mother of all living. What a beautiful thing. Also for Adam and his wife, the Lord God made tunics of skin and clothed them. So this God made them clothes. <laughs> tunics of skin and clothed them. Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us. Capital U.S. Comma. To know good and evil. Period. What do you mean? This monotheistic soul God says, Then the Lord God says, Behold, the man has become like one of us. To know good and evil. You know both. Good and the bad now. It says, and now, o comma, least he put out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. 
So you got knowledge. Now you're going to take of the tree of life. The not you know you're going to get information. You're going to you're going to get the the fruits of life, and you're going to consume it and eat. So you're going to consume it, full for thought, and live forever. Therefore, the Lord God sent him out of the garden of Eden to till the ground from which he was taken. Again, taken is used. Was Adam and Eve taken and placed in this garden? Right? Right? In the last chapter, I mean, excuse me, in the last verse, in the last verse, so he drove out the man and he placed cherubim at the east of the garden of Eden and the flaming sword which turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. So why was the cherub placed at the east of the garden with a sword to turn every way to guard the way to the tree of life. Who is guarding the tree of life and why? The tree of life. Why are they guarding the tree of life? Why are they not wanting people to get a hold of the tree of life? Life. Now I'm going to go look just one, two, one uh, verse into chapter 4, Genesis 4, says, Now Adam knew Eve, his wife, knew, double entendre. Knew is to substitute, made love to, or had sex with, right? Uh, or copulated, because these, the writers are suppressing sexual imagery or not for religious purposes, right? This is to be used for religion purposes. Okay, so that's one thing. And also is new is being used for the term sex, which was what? Knowledge in past tense. So now that they got the fruits of knowledge, now he knew <laughs> his you see what I'm saying? How they playing around with these words? He got a new son. Adam knew his wife again in Genesis 4.25. Adam, and Adam knew his wife again, and she bore a son and named him Seth. For God has anointed another seed for me instead of Abel, whom he came killed. Which perpetuated this pattern of war between brothers that continued throughout all the stories of Genesis through Ishmael and Isaac, Jacob and Isaiah, all the way through Joseph being sold by his brothers and you know, all of that. Which we wanna be we're gonna get into in another podcast. It's also I think it's important to know that in Genesis five, verses five, it says all the days that Adam lived was nine hundred and thirty years and he died. Seth lived one hundred and five years and we got Enosh. Now we know that 930 years is not a sudden death. They didn't even mention Eve again, really. They just said Adam knew his wife again. And, you know, they don't really mention Eve anymore. And so it's definitely male-centric literature. But you don't see in chapter 3 anything about a sin, right? There's not one word or one mentioning that Adam and Eve sinned. Okay, and um, the first time you see the word sin used um, is in the next chapter when God was, you know, the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry and why has your contingence fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin lies at your door, at the door. And its desire is for you, but you shall rule over it. Okay, so 
You know, it's telling him that you got he's got strength over sin, but that's the first time it's ever even even mentioned. So I think that and then also cast out that Adam I was cast out. You show me where that says that because it says he drove out the man and he but but that was that was stated in the beginning, right? When he says in there uh therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife. Joined to know his wife, right? And they shall become one flesh. One flesh is to have a child, right? When they become one flesh, when they enter, a man enter the woman, right? They become one flesh. And the manifestation of that is when they have a child, and in that child, they are now one flesh, right? A little bit of him, a little bit of her. So Adam's days was 930 years, is the oldest living as far as biblically speaking a uh, person in the Bible that I was able to see everybody else I mean after that after that lineage uh, you know there was some really old walking people down there I don't know how they would have kept their age or know how you know you can be born and then within a year or so <laughs> know how to uh, calculate the rotation of the Sun and you know measure all that but the point I'm trying to make is is that as the story is told, he lived 930 years, which is the longest lived individual. I challenge you to find someone who lived older than that. So, I mean, I'm going to just leave it at that. I know there was one more point that I wanted to make that I'm forgetting here. But in essence, the story of Adam and Eve is not a story about sin. Okay? The fall of man. The fall of man happens at the end of Genesis. Okay, Genesis chapter 50 with Joseph, right? And uh, Egypt is bankrupted. And people begin to become city dwellers and servants to the government. But that's another subject. But the subject about Adam and Eve, you tell me where is it about sin? Or is it a story about how it is said Right here, before the story is told, it said it is a story about where therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Now they were told, now, it says the serpent. The serpent. We define the serpent. We already said what the serpent is, right? The serpent is not a snake. Okay? Uh, maybe it was a uh, snake like okay and we already know what can be considered snake like that, that has to do with this knowledge <laughs> it has to do with the difference between a man and a woman nakedness it will cause a man to uh, cover up and a woman to cover up right so what I'm saying is, is, yeah, the writer is telling us something. He's trying to leave us some room to use our imagination because there's some things that they just can't say out plain, right? But, and they use, we I hope to identify several different examples of how they use double entendre, like with knowledge, right? The Lord God is just, Something that the Bible writer, I believe, used in translation of the Father. Okay? So I think that's a mistranslation. It's just a translation to make it more religious than it actually really is. It's a story allegory to, to teach you a lesson. How do you know that? First of all, um, you know, Adam and Eve, you know, we know that they had Cain and Abel, and then Cain killed Abel, and then we know that Cain went out from the presence of the Lord and dwelt in the land of Nod, on the east of Eden. That's Genesis 4. And then uh, 4, verse 16, and then in 4, 4, 17, and Cain knew his wife. Okay? Knowledge is being used again. And she conceived and bore Enoch. And he built a city and called the name of the city Enoch after his name of his son Enoch. So he found a wife, a wife east of Eden and not. So it's not saying that they're, I mean, it didn't tell you that these are the first human beings on the planet. See what I'm saying? 
And it even suggests that, and like I said, you can, you know, debate this if you want. In Genesis 2.23, therefore the Lord God sent him out of the garden to till the ground from which he was taken. So, suggesting that he was taken. Okay. And taken where? Taken from where? Taken from not, possibly? We don't know, but we know that there's other kingdoms out there. There's other nations out there, whatever you want to call it. And then Enoch was was born Erod, and Erod begot Meujel, and Meujel begot uh, Methushel, and Methushel begot Lamech, and Lamech took for himself two wives. Where are they getting all these wives from? He didn't have no more daughters. So you tell me where it's trying to state that these are the first human beings. It's not. It's clearly not. They're not by the story. They would try to hide all of that if they wanted to suggest that these were the first human beings. They wouldn't have put this right then in the next preceding chapter. The only way that you can get that off is if people don't read chapter after chapter. They don't read the book. But it's right here. It's not even being hidden. It's right here in plain sight. So, no, it's not a story about the first man and woman. It's not even being suggested that by the story. And I'll debate that with anyone. Where is it? <laughs> Where is your point? Where is your point at? Where is it said he said that? They were told you should not do that. It's like a father tells his daughter. I, I'm a father. I tell my daughter, hey, you should not have sex. I can't say you will not have it. Right? Why? Because at some point in time, she's going to be an adult to the point where she's going to make up her own mind, do her own mind. All I could do is say, you shall. You shouldn't do this until you're married, until you got a, you know, he is your, until he is your husband. Well, they were married, so there was no sin there, right? He was, they was already married, and he was, she was considered his wife. He named her Eve, but before then, she, she was his wife. Okay? And so I challenge anybody out there, leave your comments, prove your point. But this is a story about a man and a woman becoming of age. And they gave enlightenment because it says their eyes were open due to the knowledge that they received. And that all led them to the freedom well, freedom takes work. You got to work your own land. Daddy ain't going to take care of you no more. Ain't going to be paying for your food no more. See what I'm saying? And the tragedy is that their sons, now they, God never forsaken them. Their sons was given homage to the God. The ultimate true God. Right? The most high, because that's, that's what the whole dilemma was. Right? So, just on that, looking for the forward to any comments. If you like the message and want to continue to share the message, please share, like, appreciate that. If you want to support the ministry of enlightening and, and to, you know, bring leadership to the new school, I want to help a million people become financially free. This is the reason why I'm doing this. It's because I think that knowledge. Oh, that's the that's the one last thing I wanted. I did want to. I want to state here, but knowledge leads down the path of life. Okay. I'm going to talk a little bit more later on about in another podcast about. Abraham and where Abraham was from and that whole message and the morals of the story because there's a lot going on in there There's a lot going on in the story. I'm talking about slavery. I'm talking about racism. I'm talking about colonialization I'm talking about the nature of of slaves and servitude. It's a lot going on in, in, in this and where he was from in Genesis 24 um, you have to trace where his servant or his slave went to go look for Isaac's bride and Abraham did not want his servant to take 
a bride from the people in the land in which he was colonializing or the land in which he was currently inhabiting. But to go back to the land of his forefather or the land of his kindred and find a woman. And he made him swear an oath under God, which is part of the whole ideology that's being spawned out of Abraham, okay? The swearing, the making of oaths, the making of deals, jewelry, you know, or, you know, gaining access by using gold and silver as gifts, jewelry that way. But, um, it's, and then the, it's a double of tondo also, but I'm just trying to say is that I'll be getting into that in another podcast. Stay tuned for that. But I want to close this up here with, there's a story here, the Dina incident, right? Where Dina, the daughter of Leah, she had bored to Jacob, uh, went out to see the daughters of the land. And so Jacob, of course, came after Abraham and Isaac. Now you got Jacob, and Jacob is used synonymously with Israel. You got you to gotta know that these stories has a lot to do with Israel and has a lot to do with Egypt and the relationship between the two and also the relationship between the nations of the current day, okay? Um, because these, this is the mindset and the mentality. Uh, that's why I say Abraham is the founder of this modern religion or the modern societies or whatever. We know that by factual evidence, you know, we have Akhenaten, which is actually the father of monotheism, or the, you know, Akhenaten and Nefertiti, and those is inscribed in stone 2,000 year predatedness, more or less. But what I'm trying to say is that it is a lot of the mentality of the modern world is taken from the story of Abraham, okay, or can be seen in the story of Abraham, one of the two, or can be taken from the story of Abraham. But in the story uh, 34, Genesis, I'm just going to run over real quick because it's very important to, in relation to Genesis 3, um, because I want to get to the tree, the tree of knowledge, and how they use the tree to hide specific things, okay? And so in Genesis um, 34, when Jacob... Um, they encountered uh, when Shisham, the son of Humar the Hevite, prince of the country, saw her. He took her and laid with her, and it says, and violated her. So that, that's from the perspective of these writers, okay? The violation. And the violation, what is the violation? The violation is that he should have known not to sleep with the, a daughter of Jacob or a daughter of Israel, okay? Um, so his soul, but his, he was very attracted to, it, to her. Um, he spoke to her kindly. You see what I'm saying? So it says his soul was strongly attached to Dina, the daughter of Jacob, and the love. He loved the young woman. He spoke kindly to the young woman. So when they said violate, they didn't mean violate her in the sense of, you know, raping or anything. It means they violated it, this agreement or this unspoken law or whatever. You see what I'm saying? Like, like you know, the Crips messing with uh, one of the girls from the blood dudes or whatever. All right. So, so Shisham spoke to his father saying, get me this young woman as a wife. He wanted her as a wife. He goes to Jacob. He offers basically the kingdom. He says, um, and the sons of Jacob came from the field when they heard it. And the men were grieved and very, very angry because he had done a disgraceful thing in Israel by laying with Jacob's daughter, see what I'm saying, thing in Israel by laying with Jacob's daughter a thing which ought not be done. So it's kind of like this racial thing. And then they end up tricking them into a treaty. It says that they dealt with them deceitfully. You see what I'm saying? It says in verse 13, but the sons of Jacob answered Shisham and Humar, his father, and spoke deceitfully because he had defiled Dina, their sister. See what I'm saying? So they then made them believe that they was going to do a deal and but they had to get circumcised and then on the third day of the circumcision they went in there and slaughtered everybody they went in the slaughter and then they stole the women and the children right and you know they killed all the men but anyway Jacob said in in um, chapter 35 verse 2 it says Jacob said to the household and put all put to all 
who were with him, put away the foreign gods that are among you. Purify yourselves and change your garments. Okay? Change your garments. So they gave Jacob all their foreign gods which were in their hands and all their earrings which were in their ears. And Jacob hid them under the terebinth tree which was by Shisham. So in Genesis 35, it's telling you the tendency. What is he hiding under the tree? Tree is being used again. And he's hiding what? He's hiding all the foreign gods which were in the hands. Well, one of the foreign symbols that they, a lot of the believers carried in Egypt was, or North and South Kemen, and I'm sure in other, many other parts of those regions of Africa, since people migrated and went to Egypt like a, like a Mecca, but was the Unk. The Unk, the key of life. It's called the key of life, right? Uh, the male and the female symbols conjoined, producing uh, two outsprings across like image. So again, this, in, this key of life, close to tree of life, right? Something that the gods held in their hand. Something that was associated with foreign gods. Something that people held in their hands. Which also symbolized sex. The union between male and female producing offspring. So, I'm just showing you again how, you know, the Bible writer, you know, and, you know, if you think it's off, you think it's off. But I'm telling you, it's a lot embedded into this. And I'm just giving you a little bit of different perspective than you may have heard before. Uh, leave your feedback, comments. Um, thank you for listening. If you want to support the mission, hit me up on uh, Patreon dot com black swan black swan spelled with x's link is below and uh, i will be speaking to you again peace good luck